I'm serious. This one time racism saved my life, man. I was, I was on a plane. I, w I, was coming, I was coming from overseas, and uh, I don't know how this guy got a machine gun on the plane, but he stood up, man. He said, everybody, get on the fucking ground. Nobody look at my face. I started freaking out, because he was Chinese. I was like, why is he talking like that? <laughs> he was screaming and crying. I was the only brother on the plane. Well, I, I thought I was the only brother. I looked over, there was one other black dude. He was from Nigeria. I, I looked over to him, he was looking right in my face, man. He didn't say two words to me, he just looked at me, he was like. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't need to talk, I knew just what he was talking about. I looked right back at him, I was like. <laughs> Some white dudes on the front of the plane seen us, they were like, oh my God. We were just communicating that we understood the situation. We were both seeing the same thing. What we understood was simple. Terrorists don't take black hostages. <laughs> That's the truth. I have yet to see one of us on the news reading the hostage letters. Um, mm. They is treating us good. Uh, we all chilling and shit. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Ray Ray and Big Steve and uh, Jason Newport. You're not gonna see it. And terrorists are smart, they know what they're doing there, you know. They terrorists. They know it's black people's bad bargaining chips. <laughs> they called the White House, hello? We have got five black, hello? It's really some scary shit. I gotta tell you, Harvey Weinstein. You gotta make life interesting like that because the shit is flimsy. Life is flimsy. You, you think you're gonna live forever, but ain't not gonna live forever. It's dangerous out here. We know what's going on. I travel now, you know. I used to think D.C. had the roughest ghettos in the country. Nah, nigga, uh-uh. <laughs> I have seen some shit now. <laughs> oh, there's some rough, rough areas outside of D.C. Yeah, everybody should go to the ghetto. I was taken to the ghetto one time. That's the worst. When you get taken and you're not expecting to go. <laughs> you know, usually you want to know when you're going to the ghetto, like I'm going to see some wild shit. I got to prepare myself. I'm going to see something crazy. <laughs> when you're taken, it's different. I had a limousine driver. It was after a show. It was late at night. It was like 3 in the morning. I had a limousine driver. He was a nice guy talking to me and shit. Oh, hey, where you from, dog? DC, word. That's a rough city, man. <laughs> and the cell phone started ringing. Hold on one second. Hello? Oh, what's up, nigga? What? What the fuck? Stole that? What? What the fuck? No! 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 Fuck that, nigga. Fuck it. I'm on my way. <laughs> hey. I gotta make a stop real quick at three o'clock in the morning. I didn't know he was taking me to the ghetto at first. I started looking out the window, I was like, what the fuck, is gun store, gun store, liquor store, gun store, where the fuck are you taking me? <laughs> this don't look good. He didn't say shit. He just pulled up in front of an old rickety building that looked like a project. Now, I'd never been there before, I'm not sure if it was a project, but it certainly had all the familiar symptoms of a project. <laughs> a, a, a fucking crackhead ran this way. <laughs> And then, and then another one jumped out of a tree and shit. <laughs> and I said, I'll be right back. 
and left me. Took the keys with him and just left me. <laughs> At three o'clock in the morning, in front of a project in a fucking limousine. <laughs> this was not good. I was like, man, I gotta look around and see if I can see some landmarks and figure out where I'm at. Might have to escape on foot. <laughs> now, this is when I knew I was in a bad neighborhood. You only see this in the worst neighborhoods. Remember, it's three o'clock in the morning. It's three o'clock in the morning. I look out the window. It was a fucking baby standing on a corner. <laughs> <Look at this. laughs> and the baby, the baby didn't even look scared. He was just standing there. I mean, it made me sad, it made me sad, really. You know what I mean? Because I wanted to help the baby. <laughs> I was like, mm, I don't trust you either, I'm sorry. Click, <laughs> click. The old baby on the corner trick, eh? I'm not gonna fall for that shit. Where's this limousine driver? You know, I stopped feeling bad. As time goes by, I start feeling worse. Like, man, what is wrong with me? What the hell's wrong? I'm scared of a baby. And this baby could be in trouble. He might need my help. I gotta do something. But I wasn't gonna get out the car. I'm serious, man. I just cracked the window a little bit. There's an old limousine. I can roll it down. Hey, baby. The baby said, I'm selling weed, nigga. I said, oh, shit. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to buy two bags from the car. Let me get two, let me get two coins. Yeah. Got back in the car and rolled me a joint, man. So, that shit was scary, man. Every once in a while, like a crackhead would come up to the car and, and look in the window, it was like Jurassic Park, and should he be looking on the car? <laughs> hey, get out of here, Cracky. <laughs> that baby was still standing there, man. That's what <laughs> then I started feeling bad again. Yeah, weed make you feel guilty sometimes, you know. Man, what is wrong with me, man? I have just bought weed from, a, from an infant. <laughs> I can't condone this kind of behavior. What am I thinking? I can't let the fear ruin my morals. Got to do something. <laughs> hey, baby. <laughs> stop selling weed, all right? You got your whole life ahead of you. He said, fuck you, nigga. I got kids to feed. I said, God, <laughs> damn. <laughs> Sam. And just at that very moment, one of the crackheads was running across the street and got hit by a car. I know it was a hit and run. The police did it. <laughs> That's all right, they sprinkled some crack on him and got back up. <laughs> I almost protested the war in the beginning. Almost. Until I saw what happened to them Dixie chicks. I said, fuck that. If they'll do that to three white women, they will tear my black ass to pieces. I don't want to hear that shit. Yeah, man, they would. But I'm like, for real, why do why you care so much what the Dixie chicks say? It's not like they political scientists or nothing. They just bitches that can sing good. You know what I mean? Stop worshiping celebrities so much. Just don't listen, pay attention. I remember right around September 11th, uh, Ja Rule was on MTV. That's what they said. They said, we got Ja Rule on the phone. Let's see what Jaws' thoughts are on this tragedy. Who gives a fuck what Jaws Rule thinks at a time like this, nigga? This is ridiculous. I don't want to dance. I'm scared to death. I want some answers that Jaws Rule might not have right now. You think when bad shit happens to me, I'll be in the crib like, oh my God, this is terrible. Cause somebody please find Jaws Rule, get hold of this motherfucker so I can make sense of all this. Where is Jaws? Add me, Ja Rule. <laughs> I 
I've been seeing that kind of shit, man. It's what it is. They, they use the TV to program us from a young age. You ever watch like a cartoon that you used to watch when you were little as an adult? That shit is, is wild shit. <laughs> Some wild shit. I mean, like I was with my nephew. We sitting there, we watching Peppy the Pew. And I say to my nephew, I say, now pay attention to this guy because he's funny. I used to watch him when I was little. And we watch a Peppy Love Pew, but I'm old now. I'm looking like, good God, what kind of fucking rapist is this guy? Like, take it easy. <laughs> My nephew was sitting there cracking up. Hee hee. See, sometimes you gotta take the pussy like Peppy. Like, no, no, no. I had to turn the channel real quick. I turned on Sesame Street. I said, oh, whew, Sesame Street. This is much better, because now he'll learn how to count and spell. But now I'm watching it as an adult, and I realize Sesame Street teaches kids other things. It teaches kids how to judge people and label people. That's right. They got a character on there named Oscar. They treat this guy like shit the entire show. They judge him right in his face. Oscar, you are so mean. Isn't he, kids? Yeah, Oscar. You're a grouch. It's like, bitch, I live in a fucking trash can. <laughs> I'm the poorest motherfucker on Sesame Street. Nobody's helping me. Then you wonder why your kids grow up and step over homeless people. Get it together, grouch. <laughs> get a job, grouch. So don't even tell me how to get to Sesame Street. That is a terrible place. I wouldn't go there if I knew the way. Who would want to live in a neighborhood like that? Fucking six-foot pigeons walking around. <laughs> an elephant that's a junkie. Hyper. Yeah, that's right, Snuffy. Hi, bird, I'm sick. I need some smack bird. Then Cookie Monster with his eyes popping out his head, screaming, Cookie, 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 like, ugh. What kind of cookies are you talking about? Chocolate chips don't do that to people. And then they had the nerve to put a pimp on them. They didn't come out and say he's a pimp, but I know a pimp when I see one. They called him the Count. <laughs> had a cape and everything. You just see him pimping, bitch, where is my money? You've been late four times, I've been counting. How many times must I smack you before you act right? <laughs> one, two. Oh, 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 oh. That's what I'm waiting for, because the timing of this Michael Jackson shit is what makes me doubt it. Every time this war is going out of control, or the economy gets bad, or something is wrong with the world at large, it's always these moments in history that Michael Jackson will coincidentally jerk off a kid. This is getting a little ridiculous. Like, are you planning this shit? Do you have meetings? Michael, thank you for coming. As you know, Michael, the war has not been going as well as we expected. There's been a lot of hiccups, and the public is asking us a lot of questions, of course, and, well, Michael, there's no nice way to say this, and all I know how to do is be direct, so let me just be direct. We're gonna need you to jerk off another child, Mike. I'm sorry. I am sorry. But it would really help out. Or maybe he did it. Who knows? Who knows? That's the thing. That's what I wanted to say. Who knows? Who the fuck knows? Mike, God, and this little boy know. That's, that's about it. That's about it. The only reason that I can even talk about this shit is because everybody is speculating. They all think he did it. And I don't think he did it. I'm alone in this. I don't think he did it. I'm not going to say I don't think he did it. That's too strong. Let me just say I am reserving judgment <laughs> until all the facts come out. But so far from what I heard, I mean, the kid said he was dying of cancer. He was in Make-A-Wish Foundation. He claims he had two weeks to live, and it was his dying wish to meet Michael Jackson. Come on, man, give me a fucking break. This kid is 10 years old. He don't remember Thriller. The fuck you want to meet Michael Jackson for, honestly? <laughs> I remember Thriller, and I just, like, kind of want to meet this nigga. Like, 
I wouldn't break an appointment to meet him. I'll put it that way. I'd have to already be free. That's ridiculous. It's like if I'm dying in two weeks and go, oh, mama, oh, get me in a room with Chubby Chuckle. I wouldn't want to meet that motherfucker. Not, my last two weeks, why not usher or somebody like this? So then the kid claims, he goes to Michael's house. This is where it all gets crazy. I don't, like, you know, he does everything you'd expect at Michael's house. They uh, climb trees and rode roller coasters and Ferris wheels. The chef made cookies, pies and cakes. They was petting a monkey and the giraffe, sang songs, kid shit. And in the middle of all this childlike activity, for some reason, Mike pulled out some wine and some pills <laughs> and sucked his kid's dick. <laughs> Folks, it hurts me to say it. And the kid had the nerve to call that abuse. Said, Motherfucker, that is a good host. God damn, what else do you want? What else do you want? I'm lucky to get a glass of a, a great drink at my friend's house. I don't know the road coaster ride my dick sucked. Mike must be confused like I brought you in my house, I fed you, I sucked your dick, and this is how you repay me, motherfucker. This was your wish, not mine. Thought you were dying in two weeks. What happened to that motherfucker? Was, I've been in court for a year and a half. You get strong every time I see you. <laughs> uh, wouldn't that, <laughs> this is fucked up. I shouldn't even say this fuck. Wouldn't it be some ironic shit if they found out through this case that the cure for cancer was Michael Jackson sucking your dick somehow? <laughs> like if Mike had powers like Green Mile and all the kids like, please Mike suck our dicks, mm, never again. <laughs> he didn't appreciate it. Can we at least study your saliva? Mm -mm, mm -mm. Please Mike. Oh my God. But there's a more important reason that I would stop doing comedy right now. And this reason is the real reason that's been percolating and, and it really is the crowd, not you. I'm talking about the crowd on the big stage. It's too hard to entertain a country whose ears are so brittle. Motherfuckers are so sensitive, the whole country has turned into bitch ass niggas. Everything you say upsets somebody. <laughs> but motherfuckers are just taking it too far. I don't know why or how everybody got this goddamn sensitive. You know who hates me the most? The transgender community. <laughs> Yo, yeah, these motherfuckers. I mean, I didn't realize how bad it was. These motherfuckers are really mad about that last Netflix special. It's tough, man. I don't know what to do about it, cause, cause I like them. Always have. Never had a problem with them. You know, just fucking around. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think I make fun of everybody. And I mean, as a group of people, they have to admit it's kind of fucking hilarious, man. I'm sorry, bro. It's like I've never seen somebody in such a hilarious predicament not have a sense of humor about it. They're born feeling like there's something other than they're born as, and that's... That's kind of funny, you know? I, I mean, it's funny if it's not happening to you. I believe transgenders. I don't understand them either, but I know they mean what they say. Them niggas cut their dicks off. That's all the proof I need. I've never seen somebody just throw their dick away. Don't need it. I don't understand, but I believe you and I support your decision, motherfucker. I was doing a show. I was in Portland, Oregon. And I was checked in a, a hotel under the name Charles Edward Cheese. <laughs> I came back to my room late at night. And there was a, a, a note, it was like a letter on my desk, it was addressed to Mr. Cheese. So, 
obviously, I'm going to assume that whoever wrote this letter must be an intimate friend of mine. This is not some kind of name that a person would just guess. But then I open the letter, and it turns out I don't know this person at all. It's a fan letter. You know, I'm not even used to the idea that I have fans, but I'm grateful for it. And uh, I don't read those letters. <laughs> be nice if I did, but realistically, it's like, what am I, Santa Claus, Nick? I don't have time for this. Like, <laughs> got shit I want to do. I'm trying to chill. Read all these dreams and wishes from strangers. But, then I, but I read it. I'd already opened it. So I just read the whole letter. And you know what, man? Whoever wrote this letter truly loves me. I mean, they were really fucking nice in the letter. And then they described to me what it was like to come to the show, how excited they were, how much fun they were having. And then they said that when I got to my jokes about transgenders, that they were, quote, devastated. Because <laughs> it turns out that whoever wrote the letter was transgender. Now, I'm going to be real for a second. As a policy, you got to understand, I never feel bad about anything I say up here. <laughs> and I, I would never admit this to you if I hadn't locked your phones up. <laughs> but it was the weirdest thing, like when I read this letter, I, this shit made me feel bad. I didn't feel bad about what I said, you understand? I felt bad that I made somebody else feel bad. To be honest, I don't even know what I said that upset that person. I have so many transgender jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like, I feel like it was probably this joke I'm about to tell you right now. And it's not even that bad of a joke. It's a true joke. I mean, it's not true, but I, I, I had read in the paper that Caitlyn Jenner was contemplating posing nude in an upcoming issue of Sports Illustrated. And I know it's not politically correct to say these things, so I just figured, fuck it, I'll say it for everybody else. Yuck. You know, sometimes, I just want to read some stats. I don't know why you're gonna cram some man pussy in the middle of the sports page like this. I just didn't think that was the place for it. But I wasn't saying anything like Caitlyn Jenner's a bad person. I'm not mad at her for doing it. I'm not even mad at Sports Illustrated. If I'm mad at somebody, I'm probably just mad at myself. You understand? Because deep down, I know that I am not strong enough to not look at those pictures. <laughs> and I don't think I'm ready to see what she's trying to show me. <laughs> so, Caitlin, God damn it, if you go through with this thing, <laughs> bitch, you better go hard or go home. <laughs> I want you to go all the way. Hustler style. Do you know what hustler style means, miss? That means spread the lips. I hope she spreads her lips and there's an itty bitty dick inside. Ah! <laughs> the show is behind the curtains. <laughs> I don't know what I said that upset that person. <laughs> you know, I can remember when it all started. It was when I was doing Chappelle's show. When I was doing Chappelle's show, I used to do the show, and then on the weekends, I'd do like concerts and shit like that. So I'm doing a concert, and there was a couple in the front row, beautiful couple. The wife, wife was obviously Asian. You could see it in her face. <laughs> the husband, this motherfucker was mysterious, to say the least. 
couldn't quite pinpoint where he was from. Caramel colored fella, very nice hair, but he could have been from anywhere, Bangladesh, Mexico. I can't guess with a nigga like this. <laughs> All I knew for sure about this guy is that his wife was a bitch. <laughs> I could see that in her face too. No, he was laughing and having a good time and she was scowling at me at a goddamn comedy show. I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized at some point that she was pregnant and I was smoking on stage. I said, oh my God, that's probably why she's mad. So I started to put my cigarette out, but then she hit me with one of them fake non-smoker calls. <coughs> so I just kept smoking. I thought to myself, bitch, that baby will be fine, relax. And I tried to break the tension. I just asked her, that's all I said. I go, hey, wh where are you guys from anyway? And I could tell that she was on to me. She goes, very condescendingly, she says, I'm from California. If you're asking my ethnicity, I am Chinese. And her husband was just cool about the shit. He was like, I'm Mexican, bro. I said, well, I'm sorry if I offended you by asking but you're a very beautiful couple. And miss, there's no question that you're gonna give birth to the hardest working baby this world has ever seen. <laughs> That's not a bad joke. She got very upset. She got up to leave immediately, but she didn't just leave. She had to take one last dig at me on the way out. I will never buy one of your fucking DVDs again, Dave Chappelle. I said, ma'am, with all due respect, Chinese people don't buy DVDs. <laughs> and the crowd went crazy. We were all laughing, having a good time. I didn't even think anything of it. And then just three days later, this lady sends a fucking letter to my promoter telling him not to book me for shows anymore because I was, quote, racist, huh? And, and I'm quoting her, insensitive to the nature of my interracial marriage. I was like, oh, word, bitch, I was. <laughs> if she had just done a little bit of research, she would know that I myself am in an interracial marriage. That's right. In fact, my wife is Asian too. Surprise, bitch, I'll see you on Thanksgiving. <laughs> but my wife's not Chinese. She's Filipino. That's right, that's right. And our kids are Puerto Rican somehow, so there you go. 